Bo Levi Mitchell, here's a guy who's done nothing but win in his career. Something I've always thought about the entire time I've played here is leaving that legacy. Well, this has become the biggest story of the night. Bo Levi Mitchell has gone to the sidelines. This is my moneymaker. You know, this is what, what needs to last my entire career. The days of the Grey Cups year after year in Calgary, it's not looking good. Buckle up. Here comes Nick Arbuckle. 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 <laughs> yeah, the Stamps are winning, and they need to win to get that home playoff date, but you've seen them look better. The MOP is back in the lineup. Bo Levi Mitchell. He's a $750,000 man, yeah. and they got 750,000 reasons they need him on the field. As a leader of this offense, man, I, I expect more, and it starts with me. When Bo Levi gets in the zone, he's hard to stop, but right now he's not in that zone. Is this the beginning of the end of their dominance? Hi again and welcome to CFL 2020 on TSN. I'm Rod Smith. Another week into the summer and what was supposed to be a new season. Instead, the CFL continues to wait and hope for the fall. Until then, we continue to preview all nine teams with a look this time at the Calgary Stampeders. The Stamps finished at 12 and 6 and second in the West a year ago despite a slew of changes. This past offseason, there have been many more. Among those gone are running backs Terry Williams and Don Jackson, receivers Juwan Breskison and Reggie Begleton, and from the secondary, Trey Roberson, Courtney Stephen, and the retired Brandon Smith. With more on how the Stamps would shape up for 2020, here's Jermaine Franklin. Rod, coming into the season following surgery on his throwing arm, there were a lot of questions concerning Bo Levi Mitchell, like would he be healthy enough to start the year, and if so, would he be the same? But with the pandemic putting the world pretty much on pause, Mitchell was afforded a little extra time to put in a little extra precaution in his rehab journey back to 100%. Now, Mitchell has the winningest percentage in league history, and he is expected to keep that standard when he comes back for this season. And he's going to have to do it behind an offensive line that Dave Dickinson believes will be the strength of the team. And to be the safety time and time again that they have created a program that can withstand significant losses but the road doesn't get any easier with the West expected to be wildly strong. Joined once again by some virtual greatness the panel of Henry Burris, Matt Dunnigan, Milt Stiegel and Davis Sanchez. Milt, why don't you start with this? Because time after time, we've said of Calgary, until proven otherwise, they're still the team to beat. Despite all the changes, year in and year out, they remain at or close to the top. But with all these changes now, do you think Calgary is still a contender in the West? They're still a contender, but they're not the favorite. Uh, you look at over the past years, they've been able to replace their players. John Huffnagel has done a great job, but they have a lot to replace. It starts in September which hopefully there is a chance, that means there won't be much of a training camp. And you look at what they lost on defense. They lost three starting defensive backs, two to the NFL, and, of course, Brandon Smith retired. It's hard to replace that. You could bring in three great defensive backs, but those guys haven't played together. And for them to play well, they have to play together. So it's going to be hard to replace that. They still have Bo Levi Mitchell. We don't know how healthy he is, so they have a chance. But for them to be fit, considered the West right now, I would definitely have to say no way. I'm not so worried about the, much about the players. It's, I mean, they have the core coaches intact in the system. And you look around what's going on in the West, and you look at the BC Lions, you look at the Edmonton Eskimos, even change the Saskatchewan losing the coordinator, and, and, um, and Winnipeg losing Paul Police. There's some change at the coaching staff from top down, and I think that causes concern for myself. And I, and I believe everybody starts from the same starting line. And, and every year. And uh, I believe the Calgary Stampeders, they're going to find those players because they've proved to do that in the past. I just believe that um, they're right there neck to neck for the best team in the West still. I mean, Calgary's always been known as one of the when it comes to the defensive. We saw uh, a little chink in the armor last year when Bo Levi went down. Of course, they had Nick Arbuckle, but 
who do they have backing up Bo Levi mm -hmm. going into 2020? Mm -hmm. Insert name here because there's a number of young quarterbacks that they have going into camp behind him that really have to step up and show that if anything was to happen to number 19, they've got another guy who can step in and keep things going until he's able to get back on the field. But that's always been one thing Calgary has been known for is their depth, their dominance up front. But seeing how Saskatchewan and Winnipeg have improved over the past few years, yeah. they definitely are not the favorite. That's because of who can win the trenches right now. I don't think Calgary could beat those two teams. Yeah, they're not the favorite at all. And you talk about the Sask and Winnipeg. They've all gotten better over the last few years. The Stamps on paper going into this year, I would say they're probably the worst they've been in the last five years. And I put them yeah. near the bottom or possibly at the bottom of the West when I look at uh, them on paper right now. And, and to Mill's point, it's some of the, the guys that you did lose, the secondary. You can find guys, but the cohesion, I don't know if they'll have it. Now, here's where the, the thing for the Stamps is is you have a great coaching staff, you have great foundation of young Canadians, and you have arguably the league's best quarterback. So on paper, I put them at the bottom. Uh, if we're talking about would I bet on the Stamps, yeah, sure. I'd still, if I had to take two teams in the West to win it, the Stamps would probably be one of them because um, on paper, I don't love them. But with my paper, but whatever happens going forward, they were clearly the best team of the 2010s. You go back over the last 10 years, they averaged 13 wins a season. They won the West Division, or at least finished first in it, six times and won the Grey Cup a couple of times as well. Uh, they might have thought they would have had more in 16 or 17, Hank. But that's another story. The Calgary <laughs> Stampeders. Hey, by the way, we're supposed to be heading into week four, of course. We got to wait, but we're going to show you the top five plays from week four of 2019. Stick around here on CFL 2020. Nichols got it away. And a flash. And another flag in the backfield. Watch from the pocket. On the run, intercepted. It's a new kind of summer, but it's still summer.
Rodgers coming off his toughest season in 2019 when he missed seven games hampered by a short match bowl Levi Mitchell for his Well, here's what he had to uh, later in the summer or in September. You're coming along. It's been a journey for sure. Nichols, like Travis Lule, um, just trying to gauge, you know, you know, how did you feel at this point? Times that I felt bad. One thing that's been kind of overly, I guess, glaring is uh, that every injury is very and that's when you really get along but um my question is that's the offense of course how important is that uh for you well yeah i i, I do and and um i don't think that would be any different in the last you know eight years that i've been a starter on this team is our o line has been the strength of our team uh, i think the only time they haven't been is uh when we face a decent amount of injuries one year to those guys uh, I mean, it was a struggle to keep guys healthy on the line. But, you know, you've got a guy like Pat, a guy that can really develop young guys, a guy that can get a kid to fit our system and, and understand the way we play football. I think some are just a little bit as far as how to play. And then the guys that are, you know, maybe a little bit more soft, they take that extra step up. Um, you know, because Pat knows how to push him and how to get kind of that peak potential out of each guy. It's exciting to see, you know, the potential those guys can really have when they get to start to put some years together. And I think that's the exciting thing. It, we've, we've had this, uh, you know, the same guys there for a little while. And I think the more and more years you put together with, you know, five, six guys up front, um, man, they really start to blossom. So uh, I always feel safe behind those guys. So uh, I don't think that'll change next year. Matty, that was the first time in Bo Levi Mitchell's career that he missed significant time with an injury, had the surgery in December, says he could play now if he had to. Of course, uh, everybody does have to wait. Um, how much of a concern do you think that his status is for the Calgary Stampeders? Anytime you have an injury to your throwing shoulder, it causes great concern for a quarterback. And, uh, you know, Travis Lule in, in past comes to mind. Um, and uh, so I, I just think that, Bo's history, though, comes into play here. He's he predominantly healthy. The only time he, he, he has sat is precautionary methods. They've already clinched first place, and we've talked about those things. But I, Bo is an iron man when it comes to playing that position. His game really doesn't lend itself to being injured. He gets rid of the ball quickly. He sees the defense extremely well. He doesn't run it very often. He's got just a little over 700 yards rushing in eight seasons. So that's not a big part of his game. So it balls out. There has to be some concern. I think the most important thing they could do for Bo Levi Mitchell is establish a running game. You think about it last year. I mean, they averaged 71 yards a game. I think their leading rusher was Kerry with 422 yards. When you have a quarterback who's coming off a shoulder injury, who needs to remain healthy for your team to have an opportunity to win, you have to have a balanced attack. So I think – they have to establish a running game. I like Kerry. He only played eight games. I think if he can play 18 games, he can help Bo out. But if they think Bo can, you know, do what he's been doing in past years, dropping back, throwing for all those yards, I, I don't think that's realistic for them to have an opportunity to win. We all know Bo is the standard when it comes to quarterbacks in the CFL. And, and we were able to see him show his excellence last year to me more than ever before due to the fact of so many injuries that occurred within that team. And Honestly, it, I think David Sanchez played receiver. Milt Steedle III was playing receiver for Calgary. <laughs> but still, Bo was able to find a way to help that team excel as far as, uh, you, know, you know, down the stretch, especially in last, in last season, you know, with two tough teams in Saskatchewan and Winnipeg who definitely came on strong. But, guys, we all know when it comes to, you know, defining your excellence, creating your legacy, there has to be some sort of setback that has to happen. 
you know, we're going to have a chance to see Bo Levi Mitchell rise to the occasion, even though he's coming off that, sh that pectoral injury, cyst in the shoulder, having all these different surgeries in the offseason just to get himself ready. We're going to have a chance to see him mentally overcome that. I don't think he's fully healthy. I think right. there's been questions about that. You saw the zip on the ball last year that wasn't there. The accuracy wasn't there. Now forced to do it with maybe not the top-notch receiving core that uh, we've seen or he would hope to have. So it's definitely going to be a lot of pressure on Bo because of all those factors. Well, if anything affects the Calgary offense, if Bo Levi Mitchell isn't able to come back uh, yet anyway, as strong as he was, it does put more pressure, I would think, on the Stampeders running game. With more on that, let's head to the guys in the booth, Glenn Suter and Dwayne Ford. Dwayne, the panel took care of the bow discussion nicely, so I thought we could talk running backs. The Stamps have had a great run of tailbacks over the years. First guy comes to mind for me is John Cornish, but you played in the same backfield with a Hall of Famer. Yeah, Kelvin Anderson, Canadian Football Hall of Famer and CFL record holder with eight consecutive seasons of 1,000 rushing yards. Proud to be Kelvin's backfield partner for, for five years. Now, one of our teammates during that five-year window was Dave Dickinson. And at the start of that run, our offensive coordinator was John Huffnagel. So you look at those guys in their current roles as the Stampeders head coach and general manager, respectively. Dave and Huff have followed a lot of the same principles that allowed Kelvin and his quarterbacks, Garcia, Dickinson, and Burris, to be successful. And that has to do with the offensive line and having them play at a high level, regardless of who's in the lineup. When you look at this team over the last five years, last five off seasons, they've had three offensive linemen who were first round picks retire prematurely, and they've lost three different offensive linemen who are most outstanding linemen award winners, but yet they haven't missed a beat. So with the offensive line looked after, they're kind of the poster boys for that next man up philosophy that's allowed this offense to be so effective. So Suits, I guess the question is, who's the next man up at running back? Yeah, last year, the leading rusher for the Calgary Stampeders around the halfway point before he broke his arm was Kadeem Carey. And there's a lot to like about this guy. Great combination of vision, quickness, and toughness. First, the vision in the hole. This play versus Edmonton is designed to go to the left. And that's where Carey's eyes are just before he gets the ball. A split second later, his eyes scan right. He trusts what he sees and he makes the adjustment. Then again, at the second level, displays great vision on that second move as he bounces it outside. Now, lateral quickness. Carey sees the play developing, stabs that left foot into the ground, follows his blockers to the right side of the formation. And finally, toughness. He's only 5'10", but on this run, there are five potential tacklers. He drags one, slides past a couple, and drives the last two tacklers for an extra four or five yards. Nice run there. So, Dwayne, he's now healthy, and he may be the next great Stampeder tailback. Well, we've talked a lot about offense and the job they've done plugging holes on that side of the ball. Maybe a look at the defense as well, where they've got big shoes to fill with the losses of Brandon Smith and Trey Roberson. We'll see how they do over there. Stick around. We'll be back with our choices for the Stampeders all-time team when CFL 2020 continues after this.
This time last year, William Stanback took a page out of the history books. The Montreal running back ran for 203 yards, the most from an Alouette since Mike Pringle in 1998. He added three touchdowns to his stat sheet, and Stanback led the way to a home opener win over Hamilton. Uh, William Stanback has been an absolute monster. Speed and power. Stanback again! He's a bad man. William Stanback. And now it's time to reveal the all-time team for the Calgary Stampeders. 12 starters on offense, 12 on defense, a punter, a kicker, and an additional special teams player. At least seven nationals, at least one current player, and a head coach. After a 10-year playing career, Wally Buono turned to coaching, and his first stint as a bench boss was a memorable one. Over 13 years, he led Calgary to eight first-place finishes, six Grey Cup games, and three titles, en route to becoming the winningest coach in Stampeder history. Considered the greatest player in CFL history, Doug Flutie made the most of his four years in red and white by winning three Most Outstanding Player awards and one Grey Cup. He averaged over 5,100 passing yards and 35 touchdowns a year. Flutie's staggering numbers earned him the edge over fellow Stampeder greats Henry Burris and Bo Levi Mitchell. Calgary has long held a reputation for great offensive linemen, and these five are the cream of an excellent crop. Rocco Romano was a four-time CFL All-Star and an integral part of the 92 and 98 Grey Cup squads. He is joined by fellow Hall of Famer Tony Pantuskowski, five-time Western All-Star Harry Langford, seven-time Stamps Outstanding lineman Lloyd Fairbanks, and the big chill Fred Childress, a six-time League All-Star and the 1998 Most Outstanding lineman. Arguably the most competitive position on the squad, the Stamps' all-time backfield is up for debate, but there's no debating John Cornish's place among the CFL elite. The league's most outstanding Canadian three times, Cornish made history in 2013 when he became the first Canadian-born running back to be named Most Outstanding Player. The 1996 Most Outstanding Rookie, Kelvin Anderson, rushed for over 1,000 yards in each of his seven years in Calgary and was inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame in 2017. When it comes to Stampeder's receivers, one clearly stands above the rest, Alan Pitts. The franchise leader in receptions, receiving yards, and touchdowns, Pitts was a six-time All-Star and two-time Grey Cup champion and is on the short list of the greatest receivers in CFL history. Fan favorite Nick Lewis is second only to Pitts in receptions and yards. Hall of Famer Herm Harrison was a six-time Western All-Star. And Dave Sapungis was twice the league's top Canadian and three times the most valuable Canadian in the Grey Cup. He fulfills the requirement of one current player, but Rene Paredes would have made the team on merit alone. The Stampeders all-time leader in field goal accuracy, Paredes has helped the Stamps win two Grey Cups by kicking a perfect 11 for 11 across five title games. Rob Maver's impressive ability to pin opponents deep in their own territory gets him the nod at punter. And Randy Chevrier, who perfected the art of long snapping, is the Stamps' special teamer. The Stamps' all-time defensive line is headlined by five-time CFL All-Star Will Johnson, a member of the 92 Grey Cup champion squad. Johnson shares the franchise record of 99 quarterback sacks with fellow all-timer and current Saskatchewan Rough Rider Charleston Hughes. John Helton was an unstoppable force, earning all-star status in seven of his 10 seasons in Calgary and a Most Outstanding Defensive Player Award. And local boy Stu Laird had the most sacks by a Canadian-born player in league history upon his retirement in 1996. Voted Most Outstanding Defensive Player a record four times, Hall of Famer Wayne Harris is in the conversation for greatest defender in CFL history. Over his 12-year career, Harris was an 11-time Western All-Star, an 8-time League All-Star, and was named Most Valuable Player in the Stampeders 1971 Grey Cup victory. Joining Harris in the linebacking core is fellow Hall of Famer and franchise tackles leader Alondra Johnson, and Alex Singleton, whose brief but memorable three-year tenure included two All-Star nods and a Most Outstanding Defensive Player Award. Heading up the secondary is two-time Grey Cup champion Daryl Hall, a pioneer of the game as the CFL's first true hybrid or cover linebacker. Hall was a league all-star in six of his eight seasons, blazing the path for a new breed of defensive back. 
He is joined by Canadian-born Hall of Famers Larry Robinson and Harvey Wiley, Keon Raymond, who holds the franchise record in interception return yards, and Brandon Smith, who hung up his cleats following the 2019 season after a remarkable 12-year career. Many will argue that Willie Burden should be in the Stamps' all-time backfield. Instead, he is honored as a foundational player. Jerry Keeling attained all-star status as both a DB and quarterback in his 12 years in Calgary. And three-time All-Star Tom Forzani represents his brothers Joe and John and his son Johnny, all of whom suited up for the red and white. When you look at that all-time roster, it really does reflect how dominant the Stampeders have been since 1990. And Chesey, that is so true at quarterback, those dominant years by Doug Flutie. But then you've got what our friend Henry Burris did in red and white. And <laughs> after that, Bo Levi Mitchell, and even before with Jeff Garcia and Dave Dickinson. Our friend, our colleague right here, he's still the Stamps' all-time leader in passing yards, touchdowns. I could go all day, but then there will be a but after. Uh, my wife, she doesn't like me, and we know Milk doesn't like me, so why not add <laughs> Hank to the mix as well? Now Hank's not going to like me, but Doug Flutie's brilliance, dominance over that four-year period as the Stamps quarterback, that stretch of dominance, three straight MOPs, the best record in the league three straight years, we may never see that again. Yeah, and, and, and I agree with you. I uh, love my brother Henry like a brother. Top 10 quarterback all time, easily, maybe top five, probably top five first ballot Hall of Famer, which few can say. But my first CFL game was against Doug Flutie, and I've never seen anything like it before. What he was able to do on the field, it was truly special. What he was able to do in Toronto was special, but those four years in Calgary, they were some special years. He was a special player. Henry, you're a special player also, but I got to agree with Davis on that. Those four years Doug put together in Calgary, were, were, were truly special. The guys that I remember uh, on the other end of his passes were Alan Pitts, Dave Sponges, you know, two guys that are on that list. And, and I was just, they were just wearing us out, you know. And it's just like you're standing on the sidelines. I'm holding my helmet on the sidelines, and I just drop it, and I just start clapping in the middle of the game because that's how dominant they were offensively. And great representation there in Calgary. So many other fantastic players. And on the front line, Freddie Childress, the guy that I had a chance to play with, to me, when I look down this list, there's one guy to me that hits in the heart, a guy who, when I first arrived in Calgary, he was there with a big smile on his face, had, it, had his cool hat on, tilted to the side with a beautiful suit on, Sugarfoot Anderson. I mean, he's one of the first yeah. African-American players to ever play professional football back in the 50s. And the fact that his legacy was there alive and well for a lot of us to be able to experience it firsthand. And just kind of what he did along with opening up the doors for so many other skilled players. I mean, he was the Milt Stiegel before Milt Stiegel. But the one thing he had over you, Milt, was he actually had a Screen Actors Guild card. And the fact is, he was in <laughs> movies and he was in shows and stuff like that. He was more than just a football player. He was also a community ambassador. But also, he was a movie star as well, all rolled up into one guy and one fantastic person. Well, first of all, great to see Wayne Harris on that list and Herman Harrison, but Willie Burton as well. MLP 1975, 1,896 yards. He had the CFL single season rushing record, and that was in a 16 game schedule. So that's the story of the Stampeders. And that's our show for this week. Yes, next week we will focus on the Montreal Alouettes, who made great strides in 2019 with Kahari Jones at head coach and Vernon Adams Jr. at quarterback, trying to build on that with new ownership now. But first, they need to know if they're going to get that chance in 2020. And until we find out, we're going to keep looking ahead here on TSN. Thanks for watching CFL 2020.